I want to just begin. I, I love seeing our students up here. I love that uh, we get to invest in students and we get to talk about the gospel good news. If that word gospel is strange to you, just get these words good news into your heart and into your soul. I love it when students get a vision for what God can do through them. You don't have to be a certain personality type, and you don't have to uh, you know, have all of these years or experiences behind you before God says, I can use you for my glory. I love what God wants to do in their lives and what he is accomplishing in the world. And I love that it's not just students who get to be a part of it. It's true. Uh, but we get to see people of every age, people of every background, people of every education level that God says, I have plans to include you in my work in this world that we would see and acknowledge the king of heaven is intent upon and is reshaping our world in his image. And sometimes it's tough to get our focus on it, but Jesus is at work even to this moment. Amen? Amen. Lord, show us more of that, that he's doing what he's doing today. Here's, here's what I know, that as we open God's word today, the Holy Spirit has an intent to say, I want to use this in your life. And then I want it to overflow out of your life and touch the lives of others. And I want, I want the good news of Jesus to flow over this globe that no one, that no one would be left out of the great things that God has in store. And so let's be into it today. If you have a Bible, we're Bible people at Harvest here. Would you take out your Bible? Would you get it ready? If you need a Bible, would you just raise your hand? We'd love to give you one. If you want one to keep, uh, please keep it as our gift to you. We're going to be in the first half of your Bible in the Psalms and Psalm 125 today as you go there. We are calling this summer uh, as we study the Psalms of Ascent. Think of going up. Psalms of going up. They're also songs, songs of going up to Jerusalem as the people of Israel would sing these songs three times a year as they would head toward Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem, the same Jerusalem that is there today. And they would go to worship the living God. As you find Psalm 125 today, uh, we've had a chance to read it. We'll read it again uh, and just understand it. The title of the message might seem strange to you at first. The title of the message today is The Kindness and Sternness of God. The Kindness and Sternness of God. And I believe you'll understand it as we get into it here. But uh, as we go to God's word, I want to remind you of a truth surrounding God's word. Here's what I know. That we are prone to make things about us. And so when we come to God's word, and this can happen for a seasoned believer, somebody who's known Jesus for a long time, or a, a new believer, this can happen just as easily. We come to God's word, and we want to find out what it means, what it's saying about me, and what it's saying about us. And if we start there, it can lead us into all kinds of trouble, and we have to back up and say, why did God even give us his word? Why, why is this even available to us? And if you've been around Harvest for any amount of time, you'll know these things that uh, we've said multiple times, and they're true every time, that the first thing you need to know about the Bible is that the Bible is about who God is, who God is. And so if I approach it and I try to make it about me, uh, the truth is it's not about you. Primarily, the Bible is about who God is. And the second thing that you would see is that the Bible is about what he has done. It's a record for us. It's to say, look at what he did here, and look at how he moved here, and especially look at Jesus and how he came for us and what he did, and then we can know what he's accomplishing. And then three, this is the, this is the good news, because you can know what God wants for you. The third thing is this. The Bible is about how we're to live in light of who he is, and in light of what he has done. And then it, you say, well, it is about me. In this order, it's about who he is, it's about what he's done, and then it's about how we're to live in response to that. And so as we read God's word today, I think you're going to see, hey, it speaks about people, but it's also just speaking about this is who God is. Notice who he is. And so I want you to, with that filter in place, I want you to see Psalm 125 and see, oh, it's speaking about God here and telling us about who he is and what he's done. Oh, it's speaking about us and how we're to live. 
So look at Psalm 125. We've read it together as a part of our, our opening worship time together. And see it now with this filter. Psalm 125, verse 1. A song of ascents. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord, there it is speaking about God again. We've already seen that twice now. So the Lord surrounds his people. That's us. That's as it, we're speaking about people now. From this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Now, this rest in this last statement. Here it is. Peace be upon Israel. Peace be upon Israel. And let's, let's just acknowledge together today that God's word is alive. What we're, what we're reading is not some just words on a page, but it is God's word truly for us. Amen? Thank you, Lord, that you tell us who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you tell us what you've done. Thank you, Lord, that you can help us to know how to live in response to that. Thank you, Lord. And so we get into the Psalms of Ascent, and uh, we have much to learn. This passage was to be sung as a song as the people made their way to Jerusalem to celebrate. And it really was to celebrate the living God, to worship him. Maybe it would be sung as they walked along. Maybe it would be sung as the people took a break and let everyone catch their breath. Maybe it was uh, when they stopped because it was 110 degrees outside and everybody was fried. <laughs> Maybe to get some water. Maybe it was sung around the campfire at night. Regardless of its location, uh, when it was sung, it was meant to point us to the reality of who God is, what he has done, and then it was to help us to know how to live. In fact, what we're going to see here is it exposes Psalm 125 in these short five verses. It exposes three types of people. Actually, you could say it this way. It exposes three ways that people respond to the living God. And so it's about who God is, but it's about what he's done, and then it's about how we're to live. And so it tells us which, which group are you in? Which response are you in? Response one, response two, response three. Remember, there, there's one God. Yes, one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one but there are three responses today that you can learn from. Response number one, would you get this today? Response number one, for those who trust in the Lord, and I'm just going to say AKA, also known as, AKA the faithful. Those that respond to the Lord and trust in him when things are good and when things aren't. And if you live any amount of time in this world, you get to experience both, probably more of the second, when things aren't good. There's so many hard things in this world. I love that verses 1 and 2 uh, use some great grammar. Uh, grammar is one of those things that you appreciate and that you use. And uh, when you celebrate it, as it, it just lays out a, a, a picture for us today, a beautiful picture comparing the people of Israel to the location of the city of Jerusalem, which is located on Mount Zion. That is not some weird place. It's, it's a location you could go there today. What is known as Mount Zion, it's surrounded, it's, it's hilly, it's, it's not flat, it's not the Midwest, people, it's not the plains, it is, uh, it is very mountainous, and there you have Mount Zion, you have Jerusalem nestled in it. If you're picturing by mountainous like um, uh, Mount Rainier, not mountainous like that, uh, not like that. So as we look at this, uh, it says, those who trust, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. Now, I know it's summertime. I know that the, the summertime is a break in large part from the education system for many, and it's great to have a break before you go back and jump back into it. But I'm going to ask you to use your, your grammar hat today. So go ahead and put your grammar hat on for a moment. It says that those who trust in the Lord, those who have faith, the faithful are like. 
Like or as is a simile, and that means it's comparison. It's like this. It's, it's as, as this. Simile, comparison. Now, I just have to tell you, if you go home and you say, I am Mount Zion. <laughs> no, it did not say you are Mount Zion. It did not say that. It said you are like Mount Zion. The people are like Mount Zion. But those who trust in the Lord, how are, how are we like it? Well, one of the things uh, you get to see here, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. We're like Mount Zion in this. We're like Jerusalem in this, in this way that the Lord surrounds his people. It's a great picture. If you've ever had somebody just embrace you and, and care for you and, and hug on you, especially if you were scared or nervous in an event, and somebody just wrapped their arms around you, you understand what it says here, that the Lord surrounds them. The Lord envelops them. The Lord brings the people who trust in him. I want to just give you uh, today a couple illustrations to help us grab on to some things. And the first one is just uh, an illustration uh, with a, a little boy. He's three years old. He grew up in Rhode Island. Maybe you've been to Rhode Island. Maybe you haven't. And uh, his dad said, I want, to, I want to teach you how to fly a kite. And you think about a three-year-old kid who's like, it's, it's cool. It's floppy. It's got string attached to it. I want to teach you. And so they went to the seacoast. Never having flown a kite before, uh, this little boy had obvious doubts, and his father assured him it's going to be okay. Is it, is it going to fly, Dad? Is it really going to go up? What if it doesn't go up? What if it, uh, uh, are we going to be able to have it happen? Well, Dad. The dad just reassured his son that the kite would go up as planned. And so they unraveled the string. They got there, and they began to pull on the kite. And if you've ever been to, like, Cannon Beach or that area when the wind is blowing, it's not difficult to get the kite in the air. Have you noticed that? It might be, able to, might be difficult to control the kite. And here's what happened. As they unraveled the string and they watched the kite go up, the father heard his son say this, I knew it would fly. <laughs> the son, the dad says to his son, how, how did you know? How did you know? You said it would. Mm. There's something about trust in the Lord. That's the first response today. And he's saying this, there are people who put their trust in the Lord, and in when they trust in the Lord, they're like the city, the area where the Lord just surrounds them and cares for them. If you've ever experienced the Lord do that and say, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust you. Lord, I'm struggling to trust you, but I want to see you work. You're, you're like that little boy who's saying, I want to see the kite fly, but I don't know. Will it? I want to give you something about people who put their trust in the Lord. We call them the faithful, a.k.a. the faithful. Uh, I just, let's talk about that group for a moment. The faithful are a special group of people. They're special in this way. The Lord says, trust me, and they do. And that is a minority group in our world. Trust me, and they do. That's special to the Lord. He loves that. When you trust him, and I love the second part about when you're a part of that group known as the faithful, the faithful are secure. No matter what happens, no matter what comes into this life, no matter the torrent, uh, no matter the wind, no matter the rain, no matter the sun, whatever happens in this life, the faithful are secure. And I, I want you to notice the, the present tense language here uh, that is used in this. Those who trust in the Lord are like, right now, they're like Mount Zion. Right now, they're surrounded by his goodness. Right now, not someday, someday I'll be secure, someday I'll be, I'll be loved by the Lord, someday. No, today. It's present tense. It's not future tense. We will see the future tense come up in this psalm. The faithful are like this right now, and the Lord is doing this right now for his people, that he is surrounding them, even even if I can't feel it, even if I can't see it. Did you just sing that? I think you did, didn't you? Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop. You never stop working. 
as we sang that, I was like, oh, that's Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, Lord. The Lord surrounds his people, and I, I know this is true, and you need to hold on to this today. The Lord surrounds his people, and it's not for just a little while. And this is important because of this. We have a world that has very little permanence to it. Things are shifting all the time. Things change all the time. Because of the impermanence of our world, we have people that walk out on us. We have, we have, we have people that walk out of our, our families. They walk out. We have people that walk out of our, our friends. They were friends and now they're not and they walk out on us. We have people that, what well, we said, we're going to serve together for years. We're going we're to work together for years. The people that uh, partners in business and commerce walk out. We don't know a lot of permanence in this world. I'm just going to uh, put this out there. When people walk out on us, including other Christians, that hurts. When organizations let us down, including the church, that hurts. And worst of all, this is the worst one that, that lets us know so intimately that this is true. When we let ourselves down, when we fail ourselves, I'll never do that. I would never say that. I would never go there. And then we do. What can I truly depend on? And here's the truth, and you can see it right here in Psalm 125, verse 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. And then let this just give you comfort today. From this time forth, and would you say the word out loud? Forevermore. You're like, I never use that word. It is the promise of the Lord. Others will let you down. Others will walk out on you. Others will forsake you. But that's not who I am. Those that trust in the Lord are trusting in the right object for their faith. The living God is who you want to put your trust in. You want to put your trust in what does have permanence, not what doesn't have permanence. And I love this. You can trust in the Lord, and you can trust that the Lord will be faithful to you from this time forth and forevermore. I don't move like those other things in life, everything else in life. The faithfulness of the Lord is what empowers people to be faithful. I want to be faithful. Then put your trust in the Lord Model him. Let's go on to response number two. Those who compromise with culture, a.k.a. also known as the compromised. So we have this group who's saying, I'm going to trust in the Lord. And then there's this next group that are those who said, I trusted in the Lord, but now I'm going to the compromised. Verse 3 says it this way, For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. And here's what happens, and it's true. It happens in our world today. There are some that followed the Lord, and then they stretched out their hands to do what they wanted to do. They said, I'm going to do what I want to do. When it talks about the scepter of wickedness, if you look at Israel's history, they were ruled at different times under the authority of ungodly leaders from other nations who came in. And so they were under the hand of ungodly leaders who led them whatever way they wanted to lead them. But there were many times that they were under the hand of their own people who chose to do what they wanted to do. And so there were times where it was external pressure operating on them, but many times it was internal there, they had both of those pressures, and they had to choose whether they're going to trust the Lord or they're going to listen to the external pressure, the ungodly leaders, or the ungodly leaders who are their own people, including themselves. 
I'm going to listen to me and do what I want. I, this, by the way, this is, this is a big one. I deserve to be happy. Man, I'm going to tell you, just in years of ministry now, I've watched people chase happiness, and they've chased it into terrible, destructive places. I deserve it. I want it. I'm going to go after it. And I've had the opportunity to talk to some people, and it usually doesn't go well when I say, are you happy yet? Because I, I heard you're going to, now is the time for you to be happy. Are you happy? No, but if I just do this or if I just get this, then I'll be happy. I said, so you're still in that unrelenting pursuit of chasing happiness, and you haven't achieved it yet. Hmm. Lord, help us. Because we all want to be happy. We want that, but it can lead us to compromise. And what happens is when we face external pressure from others, it could be family members, it could be coworkers, it could be friends, it could be simply the culture at hand, or it's internal pressure, we are people who tend to cave and adapt. And I want to give you an illustration for compromise. The illustration for trust is that little boy who put his trust in the father said, it'll, it'll fly. And when it flew, he's like, ah, it's just like you said. So here's an illustration for compromise today. Winter is, was coming on, and a hunter went out into the forest to shoot a bear. I've been watching this series called Alone, if you've ever seen it. It's frustrating. Um, Winter was coming on, and a hunter went out into the forest to shoot a bear, out of which he planned to make a warm coat. By and by, he saw a bear coming toward him, and he raised his gun and took aim. Wait, said the bear. That's unusual. I will agree. (laughs) Wait, said the bear. Why do you want to shoot me? Because I'm cold, said the hunter. But I'm hungry, said the bear. Maybe we can come to a compromise. And so they did. In the end, the hunter was well enveloped in the bear's fur, and the bear had eaten his dinner. Some of you are like, what? The hunter was no longer cold. He was no longer alive. And he was enveloped in the bear's fur. They both got what they wanted. That's how it looks for compromise. We always lose out when we try to compromise with sin. Hear that again. We always lose out when we try to compromise with sin. It will consume us in the end. It's a silly little illustration, I know. But the point is so real. We always lose out when we try to compromise with sin. It will consume us in the end. Why do we compromise? I thought we were going to be stronger than that. We're going to follow Jesus. We're going to trust in the Lord. And then, well, here's three reasons that we tend to compromise. We compromise because it's easy. It takes very little work. It takes very little work. To compromise. We compromise because we get weary. We get weary of standing up for what's right when everybody else seems to be just going by us. And seeming, by the way, sometimes to get blessed. Wrong word, but it's what we see. They seem to have it all. They seem to have what's good. They seem to be happy doing what everybody else is doing. And so we get weary. It's easy to compromise. We get weary, we compromise. And honestly, here's the the truth. We compromise for our own benefit. If I do this, I gain. I get something. I get what I want. We compromise for our own benefit. So as we look at this, I I want you to think about what we've seen so far. Those who trust in the Lord, a.k.a. the faithful, and those who compromise with culture, a.k.a. the compromised. There is one God, and yet we've seen so far two responses to him, faithfulness or compromise. Right now, I just want you to stop and and think. Let's just do a moment where you're saying, I want to look back from the last time, a week ago Sunday, to today. How did my week go? Was it a week of trusting in the Lord, or was it a week of compromise? You say, well, I had a, maybe, maybe it was a mix. 
which one did you tend toward in this past week? Was it a week of trusting in the Lord, faithfulness, or was it a week toward compromising with the culture around you? Before we move on to that third response to the living God, I want you to look at the, a simple prayer that is put here in verse 4. Uh, I want you to see that. If you have your Bible, look at that. We're a simple prayer. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and those who are upright in their hearts. Lord, would you, would you just come alongside? Would you, would you care for? Would you strengthen? Would you, would you bless those who want to follow you? Would you just do that, Lord? What a great prayer out of verse 4. I think the Lord answers that prayer with yes and amen. Would you do good? Yes. <laughs> would, you, would you honor those who want to follow you? Yes. Would you continue that? Yes and Amen. Go ahead and keep asking me that because the answer is always the same. But I, I have to stop right there. And what happens in our world right now is sometimes we take that and we say, I'll take that and we turn it into the prosperity gospel. And if you haven't heard that term before, I'm going to just help us understand it. Prosperity gospel is really deal making. I'll do this for you, then you do this for me. I'll put $100 in toward the HVAC. And Lord, you send back $1,000 to me. That's prosperity gospel. I'll give you this, but you better give me this. It's a deal. We'll shake on it. We'll shake on it. I'll follow you. And then it's, it's like a strong arm tactic with God. I'll follow you. I'll do this. And then you have to bless me. That's prosperity gospel. I'll obey you. And then you have to give me the good stuff. And it's usually stuff. Sometimes it's relationships. I'll do this, but you better give me <laughs> happiness and the way I determine it. You better give me health. You better give me wealth. You better give me an easy life. Lord, you know that that mega millions lottery, I bought a ticket and you didn't honor it, Lord. You didn't honor it. The problem is with this is that it can be demanding heaven here on earth. And on earth, the presence of sin is still real. There's brokenness here that includes sickness. It includes tragedy. It includes trauma. It includes addiction. It includes all of the hard stuff that we don't like. But it should not stop you from praying, verse 4. From praying for blessing and protection. But this is the thing. Lord, I pray that you would, as I, as I honor you, I pray that, Lord, you would see that and that you would honor it. But without a demand, without a demand, because here's what happens. When you don't get what you want, what happens a lot of times is you get angry. Lord, it's been 110 all this past week. What's the deal with that? Are you trying to persecute us? Lord, I, I don't know why you would do this to us. And the Lord's like, it's summertime. It gets hot here every year. And because it's hot, been hot this past week, now it's my fault. Have you noticed that? Like, oh, Mother Earth, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, act of God. <laughs> when something happens, we blame him. We can do that. So it's not getting mad at God, but this is what I'd say. <laughs> Here's what I think God would say. You ready for this? At least it's a dry heat. <laughs> Thank you. 110. But at least it's a dry heat. Yeah. Some of you are like, that's not funny, Jason. I know. Put that on your connection card. That wasn't funny. <laughs> Let me take you to response number three. Response number one was the faithfulness, trusting God. Response number two was compromising with the rest of culture. And number three is actually the worst result and response number three is this, those who willingly rebel against God, a.k.a. the rebellious. I know what you want, God. No. I know what you want me to do. No. I'm not going to do what you want. I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what you want. That is rebellion against God. And the people of Israel understood it. In fact, if you read your Old Testament, you will see so much rebellion. We know what God wants. No. No. In fact, I don't know if 
if you had this, but some of your kids, you're like, what was their first word? It was daddy or ball. And then you're like, no, my kid's first name was no. Their first word was no. No, no, no. They were born with a strong will. I'm like, yeah, did you meet their mother? You know? I'm saying that for my own home, all right? Not yours. And then my wife would say, did you meet their father? And then we would look at each other and say, yep, it's true. Now, this might sound attractive at first. Rebellious, to be rebellious, to be bold, to be strong. It might sound very American. Nobody tells us what to do. Nobody. We got the rebel flag and we got the rebel yell. And this, is, this, is, this is good. It sounds good. But when it comes to the living God and you know what he wants for you and it is good and you say no to what is good, it's destructive. Verse 5 says this, But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Hmm. Those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Read Israel's history in the land. The Lord instructs them to follow him, to be a light to the world around them, to be a light to the world around them. Those who you bless, I will bless. He will bless them. That was the plan. But you read Israel's history and rebellion, 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 after compromise, compromise, compromise. He's very clear. If you compromise and or rebel, he said, I have to. The living God has to bring correction and discipline. In fact, I will even use, um, he says this, I'll even use the ungodly nations around you to lead you away so that I can get your attention and get a hold of your heart again. Notice what he said there. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. I'll use people that are are more rebellious than you to lead you away so that I can get through to your very hardened heart. I want to give you something about God. Remember, as we talk about the Bible, about who God is. I want you to see something about his character that is true every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year. The character of God is truly this all the time. He's holy, he's loving, and he's just, always. It's not that he's loving on Tuesdays and on Thursdays we get his justice. The character of God is always consistent. He's holy, he's loving, he's just, always. And as you read this psalm, it reminds me of a passage uh, that really sums it up for me. And I learned it in the uh, New Living, no, excuse me, NIV, New International Version. I memorized it here. And so I want to use this, and this is where the, the title of the message comes from. And I want you to see this as you read this, that God, throughout Psalm 125, the holy God has these attributes. Romans eleven twenty two 22 see it, says it this way. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And he's talking about learn from the nation of Israel and learn from history that God's heart is to be kind to his people and to be kind to the world. That's what he wants. But if he's somebody who says, I'm going to do what I want to do, I'm essentially God and you're not, he must respond with sternness and not say, that's not okay. It's the little kid who's reaching for the hot pan on the stove and the parent says, no, don't do that. And they use that stern voice. No, that's not for you. No. Don't do that. Sternness. Well, that didn't sound very loving. Actually, it was very loving. The kindness and sternness of God, uh, that, that, that understanding has blessed me in so many ways that God isn't kind some days and stern other days. He's both kind and stern. He's both loving and just. The holy God is both of these at the same time. But we're people who tend to go to extremes. 
We go to kindness. We love God. He'll just, whatever you do, God will just accept it. Loving, loving, loving. And then when we want somebody else to be punished for their wrong, sternness, sternness, give them justice, God. Give them justice. I watched this with the, with the, the difficulty in the area of Ukraine. You know, where we say, hey, we, we love the kindness. We want kindness for those who are being assaulted, but we want justice for those who are assaulting. Those are good desires, both of them. Those are good desires. We don't do it perfectly, but God does. God is always holy. He's always kind. He's always just. Continue to do that, Lord. Continue in your kindness, continue to exercise perfect justice. He's not afraid to correct people who he loves. He's not afraid of it. I love it this way. Pastor Max Lucado has a quote that I've just held on to for a long time. Pastor Max Lucado said it this way, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. That's good news for us, amen? Lord, thank you that you love me just the way I am. I don't have to get all cleaned up before you love me. You love me just the way I am, but you refuse to leave me that way. He's kind, he's loving, he's not a marshmallow who has to bend to our every whim. He's stern, but he's, listen to this. We tend to one of those extremes. If you see him only as stern, I need you to see his love. I need you to see his arms surrounding. I need you to see his protection. He's kind and loving. He's not a marshmallow. He's stern, but he's not abusive. Hmm. See, people of faith know that God will one day judge the disobedient. That's good news. No matter how much they seem to get away with right now, God's perfect plan will accomplish his perfect will. The future is your friend when Jesus is your Lord. Would you hold on to that today as we wrap it up from God's word in Psalm 125? The future is your friend when Jesus is your Lord. How many of you take comfort in that? Would you just show me your hand? The future is your friend. I'm I'm scared about what the future brings. The future is your friend when Jesus is your Lord. How do you know that from Psalm 125? It's where we end this psalm. Peace. Peace. Be upon Israel. Peace. True peace is found in the presence of Christ. And one day, one day, Jesus will rule and reign in Jerusalem over the whole world. The Bible says that day is coming. How soon will it come? We're closer than we ever have been. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's what Revelation says to pray. At the end of Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We look forward to that day when peace will not only be in Jerusalem and not only on Mount Zion, not only in Israel, but the whole world will be under the beautiful rule and reign of the Savior. So we have one God, holy, loving, and just, and we have three different responses to him. And so today it's a heart check as we come to the end and say, Lord, where are you at in those categories? Maybe it, maybe it was this past week that you really did seek him and you tried to honor him and, and you did that. Maybe it was just a week filled with compromise or, and some of you know this, my week was just filled with out and out rebellion against God and I'm really struggling. Hmm. Lord, would you do what only you can do? That's what we're gonna ask the Lord to do. And each of these responses... Strengthen those that want to have their faith in you. Help those that have been wrestling with compromise. Soften those who are in rebellion. just want to have a moment to pray. And this is where you say, 
What am I supposed to do with this? You do a heart check and you say, Lord, this is where I'm at right now and I'm going to need you to meet me here. And the Lord said, I'm ready. I'm ready to meet you. I'm ready. And then we're going to sing about who he is. And we're going to sing about what he's done. And then we're going to say, Lord, help us to follow you. Would you join me in prayer right now? Father, I pray for those this week that have uh, truly just wanted to follow you and you have uh, been working in the area of their lives and helping them to trust you. Lord, continue that work. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, we want everyone here to love you and follow you with all their heart and soul and mind and strength, but we also recognize it's a struggle. I pray for those that have been just this past week going back and forth with compromise, wanted to follow you one moment, and the next moment wanted to do our own thing. Jesus, show us that you love us right where we're at, but you refuse to leave us that way. Lord, I pray for those who are rebellious right now, and I, I, I praise your name that your word breaks through to the hardest of hearts. We see that recorded in your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would break through to the most stubborn of hearts. Lord, if that's us, I pray that you'd break through. Do your work. Soften. Help us to embrace you. And Jesus, I pray that this week would be a week that we would follow you knowing that you have surrounded us from this time forth and forevermore. You have a plan to love us and lead us. Let us experience what a great God you are. We praise the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Would you just join me and stand as we sing and celebrate a God who ministers to us right where we're at.